Well, here we are, heading towards Easter. It's coming up faster than the days get away from me. And all of a sudden, I'm like, what day is it? Where are we at? What are we doing? Wait, slow down. <laughs> but I was spending some time in the book of Mark this week, reading some very familiar stories. And I thought, I wonder, as the days race by and the minutes are ticking away, that are we thinking about where we're headed? That eternity decision, that spending eternity with Christ, is spending eternity with God. That's really that's what Easter is all about, is being able to celebrate that. And I wonder if we sometimes as I've talked about last week, we almost get into a... Mm. Life's crazy. It's busy. And all of a sudden, it's at the end of the day, it happens to Terry and I in the office, we're working, and we're working, and all of a sudden we look up and we're like, whoa, where did the day go? Did we get anything done today? But I think that sometimes we have to stop and remember what this is all about whether we're opening church doors, cleaning floors, gardening, uh, getting the church ready for church, all of that's important, but it's really, really about the fact that we were redeemed. Without the redemption, this is just one more thing to do. And I don't know about your life, I don't need one more thing to do. I got plenty that I can create all on my own. So today we're going to talk about a couple of miracles that take place in the book of Mark. The first one is the calming of the sea. So Joe, if you'll pull up Mark 4, verses 35 through 41. If you're at home, go ahead and turn to that. I'll give you a minute. Go ahead and give me a thumbs up when you're at that place so that I know we're all on the same page, get ready to do the same thing. Good job, John. For a change. <laughs> It said that day, when evening came, he said to his disciples, Let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. A furious squall came up, and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. Then the wind died down, and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, Who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. Now, they've been with him for a bit by now. They've seen some miracles, right? And so I'm sure Jesus is like, what don't you get? That's a really important question, and I get asked a lot. Who is Jesus? I mean, who do you really think it is? Think about how would you answer to someone? Who is he? Could you? answer that question? Could you define Jesus for someone that doesn't have any, I'm not talking about talking to the person you go to church with every Sunday, we're all going to kind of have the same kind of definition, but what if I was talking to someone that knew nothing about Jesus? Nothing. They've never even cracked the Bible. They've never heard a single service. They've never heard a single hallelujah. They've never heard Son of Man. They've never heard anything. They don't know. How would you describe him? Could you? It is a question that we might ask ourselves today, although maybe for not the same reasons and not in the same way. But I think that we still ask, who is Jesus? I think that the world is looking, saying, who is God? Who is Jesus? Where is he? Why isn't he present? Why did he allow all this to happen? And we can argue those. But tonight is not why we're going to answer those questions. But we are going to answer who he is.
If you go to uh, the next scene that we're going to, the second story that we're going to read, it's going to be Mark 5, just right there. Verse 1, Joe, if you'll bring that up. In my chat, if you'll go ahead and wave, thumbs up, heart, whatever you need to do to let us know you're there, that would be fantastic. They went across the lake to the region of Gerasenes. When Jesus got out of the boat, a man with an evil spirit came from the tombs to meet him. This man lived in the tombs, and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain. For he had often been chained hand and foot, but he tore the chains apart and broke the irons on his feet. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and in the hills, he would cry out and cut himself with stones. When he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and fell on his knees in front of him. He shouted at the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? Swear to God that you won't torture me. For Jesus had said to him, Come out of this man, you evil spirit. Then Jesus asked him, What is your name? My name is Legion, he replied, for we are many. And he begged Jesus again and again not to send him out of the area. A large herd of pigs was feeding on the nearby hillside. The demon begged Jesus, Send us among the pigs, allow us to go into them. He gave them permission, and the evil spirits came out and went into the pigs. The herd, about 2,000 in number, rushed down the steep bank and into the lake and were drowned. Those tending the pigs ran off and reported this in the town and the countryside, and the people went out to see what had happened. When they came to Jesus, they saw the man who had been possessed by the legion of demons, sitting there, dressed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. Those who had seen it told the people what had happened to the demon-possessed man and told about the pigs as well. Then the people began to plead with Jesus to leave their region. As Jesus was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed begged to go with him. Jesus did not let him go, but said, Go home to your family and tell them how the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. So the man went away and began to tell the De- Decapolis show, the Catholic show. It's all one word. It's weird. Anyway, much Jesus had done for him, and all the people were amazed. Hmm. When we first hear that response from the disciples, now remember they've they've been walking with him, so I mean they've had firsthand everyday conversation with him. And they say, Who am I? They say, Who is this man? Even the wind and the waves obey him. Hmm. I wonder, would we? Do we? Sure. They were still figuring out who he was. Remember that they were looking for something different, and some of them didn't even know that they were looking. If in Mark 5, it talks about a man that's possessed by demons living in the tombs in a Gentile land. See, he's not standing in front of the Jews right now. He's in a Gentile land. This man was had self-inflicted wounds upon his body. And he comes up to Jesus, and he steps out of the boat, as he steps out of the boat, and almost says, What do you want with me, Son of God? Most high. You see, the demons knew exactly who he was. They didn't have to learn. They weren't like, hmm, I wonder. They knew who he was. That's why they made him, please don't torture us. Please don't throw us out into the region. Please don't do any of that. And he says, well, who are you? And they said, legion, meaning many. Jesus and his disciples, when they go into a Gentile land, Mark notes they had entered this region on purpose. But the focus for Mark wasn't exactly where they were, but it was about 
the fact that they were in a gentle area, a Gentile area. So we're going to do a little scripture learning tonight to understand the scene, and then I'll tell you why it matters to me today. When they're in this Gentile area, they make it a central part of the Greco-Roman world. Mark wants to make it clear that Jesus' mission was to expand outside of Judea. Right? That's the, it had to get bigger than that. Because remember, he came for all men, right? Just not the Jews. He came for all of us. The demon described in great detail to the discomfort of the Jewish listener. Why would they be uncomfortable? Why would that be weird for them, for him to describe that in such detail? Well, I'm going to tell you. When it says that he has lived in the tombs, it was commonly believed that at that time the demons were spirits of the dead. That's what they believed. So that was going to be really weird for them. Right? Because they're thinking, well, this man's a spirit then. The Jewish audience hearing about someone described as living in the tombs would understand that he was demon-possessed that some dead spirit had taken a hold of him. That's what the, how they would have processed that. That's what they would have thought. The tomb's detail would also trigger thoughts of uncleanliness to the Jew, Jewish ears, because Jews weren't supposed to touch dead bodies. He cuts himself with stones. In Leviticus 19.28, you don't have to turn there, but it's the third book of the Bible, I believe. Um, it says, Joe, can you pull that up for me? Do not cut your bodies from the dead or put tattoo marks on yourselves. I am the Lord. He really tells them, you're not supposed to cut on yourself. You're not supposed to do those things. Especially if you're trying to, um, if you're not being led in the right direction. Let's just put it that way. He says, self-injury was often a sign of worship to another religion. That's really what that was about. A Jewish audience would hear that he had cut himself and had another reason to consider the man unclean. So, so he's living in the tombs. He's demon-possessed. And now, now he does self-infliction, which is all makes him an unclean man. And Jews don't touch unclean people. Right? That was their laws. That was the way that they lived. Uh, Joe, uh, even though the Jews might view the demons entering the pigs as a good thing, the incredible thing is that the Jewish would see the pigs as unclean. So that would have been weird for them too. So here we are in the book of Mark. Here we are. He, they're in the land of the Gentile. He's talking. Mark is now talking to the Jews. He's not talking to the land of the Gentile. And he's explaining all this to them. And in their ears, it would have been offensive at best. Hmm. The very presence of a herd of pig would, in the story, would unsettle the audience. It is yet another reminder that they are in Gentile territory because you wouldn't find a herd of pigs with the Jewish community. It doesn't work like that. It just wouldn't happen. Moreover, yet another reminder that they are in Gentile is that he is naked. He was naked in the tombs. He wasn't clothed. He was naked. That would have been offensive to them again, only proving again that he is unclean. They find the man, and when he's done, when, when Jesus has come, and they have told that he's told the demon to leave, the man comes dressed in his right mind, cleaned up, put together, because now the demon is no longer in him because Jesus told them, Legion, to go. You can go get the, go in the pigs, and then the pigs run over the cliff, fall into the, into the lake, and they die, right? The implication is that just as he was not in his right mind previously, he was also not clothed. Public, public nakedness was a shameful thing in the Jewish culture. It was just another signal, another signal to the Jews that this man was unclean. So, if I believe, if, I'm a Jew, if, I, if I have a Jewish thought, and so all these things are telling me that this man is unclean, what do you think would happen when Jesus went and touched him and talked to him? What do you think the Jews would have believed? They would believe that he would become unclean. 
Because that's what happened to them if they did it. They would become unclean. That's their belief. That's how they believed it happened. You do not eat unclean meat. You do not perform an unclean. You do not touch people's leprosy, right? They don't do that. They're unclean. Jesus' interaction with this unclean Gentile demon should, according to Jewish law, also make Jesus unclean. But instead of being made unclean, Jesus made the man clean. There's where the miracle took place for the Jews. All of a sudden, he was not unclean. He made that man clean. That is why those deemed unclean had to leave the community, right? If they were unclean, they could not live in the community of Jews. You weren't allowed. You had to leave. You, you, you can go to Leviticus and read about it. They, they would have to live off away from the community. They were not allowed to live in the community. They were ostracized for lots of reasons. Right or wrong, I'm not judging. I'm just saying that that's what the rules, and that's how they lived. Those that, that is why those who were deemed that, that lived in other communities, they would announce their uncleanliness to passersby, so that they wouldn't be infected, or they wouldn't become unclean because they were trying to help them, or they would tell them, "Oh no, don't touch me, I'm unclean." And you'll see that. And there's a story when Jesus goes to talk to someone with leprosy, and he goes to touch her, and he's like, "Lord, don't touch me, I have leprosy." And Jesus says, "No, I got this." Paraphrase, of course. I'm sure he didn't say, "I got this," but paraphrase it. I'm sure. I got this. Jesus breaks an expected boundary in multiple ways. First, rabbis are not expected to ever go into a Gentile area. Jesus would have been considered a rabbi. They, he, they didn't go into Gentile areas. That's not where they were supposed to be. And where did Jesus go? Right where he was not supposed to be. Then a demon approaches him, and instead of ignoring the man, Jesus talks to him. He talks to the demon. What do you want? Why, why are you here? What's your name? Tell me about you. Jesus does not become unclean by this encounter, but instead has the power to make the man clean. The next thing that you'll find if you follow along in Mark is that Jesus raises a dead girl. Jesus also heals a woman that had been hemorrhaging for a decade. And she just touched his robe, and he knew immediately that he had cleaned her. All of those things, according to the Jews, would have made him unclean. And yet he was cleaning them. He was raising the dead. Because what was the question that we asked in the beginning? Who is he? Hmm. The next thing, the, the Jewish woman that was bleeding, remember that men, if a woman was menstruating in the Jewish culture, men couldn't even sit on the chair that she had been on because they would be considered unclean. There was a certain amount of time, and I honestly don't know how long it was, but they, I, I want to say it was like 30 days, but I don't remember, but they couldn't even sit on the chairs because they would be considered unclean if they had done so. So when she touches Jesus, he's not made unclean, she's made well. Jesus is redefining the boundaries of holiness. Jesus is redefining who he is. Remember that last week we talked about the Pharisees and all the rules that they lived by and all the regulations they put out there and how we were supposed to fast and how we were supposed to do these things. But Jesus is like, no, this is not how it goes. Listen to me. Remember, I didn't come to replace the law. I came to fulfill it. These were no longer about avoidance. Jesus longs to see all people restored to a wholeness of life. Regardless of where they currently are, do you believe that if Jesus, no matter where you are, do you know that God wants to restore you? That God wants you to be the person he created you to be? That's why he went to the cross. That's why Easter matters. That's why that he, he prays. That's what communion's all about. That's what the new covenant is all about. It's all about the fact that no matter who you are and where you are and what you've done, I don't have to know. I don't need to know. But Jesus already knows and says, it's okay. I've got you. I died for you.
Jesus longs to see that wholeness in your life. What would be significant about Jesus healing an unclean demon-possessed Gentile? Well, because he should have been made unclean when he did it. But because of who he is, remember, who is he? That's what they said in the boat. Who is he? His disciples, who've been walking around, watching him do these things, said, who is this man? The demon, remember, the demon knew who he was. They're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. We know who that is. They didn't need to be told. They knew. What I hope that those stories help for you is that you knew that you may not have accepted Christ as your Savior. You that has not accepted God in your life. What I hope that those stories teach you is that no matter who you are, where you've come from, it doesn't matter to him. He loves you the same. All of us. Do you find yourself, for those of us that have come to the Lord, often seeking holiness instead of observing boundary lines? Should we be? You betcha. You betcha. I don't need a bunch of boundaries. God didn't pay attention. Jesus didn't pay attention. Boundaries. Look at all the boundary lines he crossed when he did that. He never even hesitated. He did what he was supposed to do. And that's what God calls us to do. Stop looking at the world's boundaries. I get there, there. I understand. But I have a plan. So when I'm seeking the things of holiness, I'm seeking the things of God. What does God want in my life? Pam, I want you to go do this. Okay. I've decided that fighting and arguing with God is a new point. He's just going to wake me up and wake me up and wake me up until I listen. Okay. Who is he? That's where we began this journey, the beginning. Who can calm the wind? Who can calm the waves? Not only would that have been really cool to see, just tell me, why? watching him just calm down a squall like that, or watching him part the Red Sea, would that not be amazing? That would have been so cool. I want to be part of that. He has also the power to restore people. Do you know that he's still restoring people today? Do you know that he wants to restore people today? That this is his point and our job is to help spread that message. I can't save you. Only God can do that. What I can do is lead you right to that place. Lead you to the place where you can have an, an intervention with Christ. And he says, I, I got you. Stop running from me. Someone who was viewed as unclean and unwanted, both by Jews and Gentiles, is now clean. That man physically lived outside his community and now has been drawn into his community because he's clean again. He was separated from himself in many ways. He was given wholeness and clarity of mind. You see, when the legion was inside of him, he, they controlled everything he did. But now he's clean. He can now come back into the community. Look at our community outside. How many of those people are living outside our community? Do we have the opportunity to bring them in instead of ostracizing them? Let God take care of it. God's taught us how to do it. They use some powerful language when they talk about legion. Usually that means that he has some kind of point. First, that Jesus has a point of power because he commands things to happen. Legion is the group of the, the name of the group of the demons and it used to be used in the Roman army to think about 6,000 soldiers. 6,000 soldiers. So imagine how many demons were inside of this man. And yet he said, go. Get out. 
Jesus, or, Jesus orders the demons with the word used for a military command, and then the pigs rushing into the sea is the same language used for troops rushing into battle. The imagery shows how powerful the opposition is. But it emphasizes the strength and power of God. Do you think that God still has that kind of power today, or do you think he's just getting weak over time? Of course not. He's just as powerful today as he was then. See, God never changes. God is always the same. That's what scripture promises us, is that it never changes. He's always the same. His power is the same. And if you are struggling, he wants to help you. He wants to restore you. He wants to make you clean. But it requires something from us, doesn't it? Mm, I know, you're thinking it here. Pam's going to say that word again. It's coming. I know it. And I am. Every chance that I get, you must surrender unto him. Let him change you, even if you're not sure. I don't know where it's going. We talk to people that are in recovery, and I, and I have consultations with them, and their fear about recovery is that, well, I've lived in chaos so long, I don't know how not to. I live in chaos and addiction for so long, I don't know how not to be there. Now, maybe I don't struggle with an addiction, but I certainly have enough chaos in my life. I mean, we can all say we've got some chaos. Can you create your own chaos? Maybe I'm the only one in the room. Maybe none of you have ever done that, but I can create chaos in my life just fine. I'm good at it. And God says, stop. What are you doing? Stop it. Be still. What did he tell the wind? Shh. Sit down. He says that to me. Hmm. If you were one of the disciples that just watched what he did, what do you think you would be thinking? What do you think the disciples were thinking? Hmm. Wow. I don't know about you, but I, I, I would just imagine, I, I can't help but think, and it'd be like, whoa, what just happened right here? Who is he? See, they ask the question, we think, well, duh, why would he ask that question? But I'm pretty sure they're probably like, whoa. What just happened right there? Because remember, the demon knew who he was. He told them who he was. He, they ran up to him and said, Why are you here? What do you want, son of man? What do you want? And he says, For you to go. Now go. What did they tell? They begged him, Please don't torture us. Please don't leave us here. Please let us just go be with the pigs. All right. Go on. Hmm. That Jesus, the Son of the Most High God, longs to bring a wholeness to our community. Do you believe that? You betcha. There's churches up and down this road. And I promise you that we could fill every church to capacity and there's still work to be done. There's still work to be done. Because we have a world that is hopeless. It's lost in chaos. There's a lot of people that believe that God has abandoned us. I'm here to tell you, God has not abandoned us. He is right here. And he's told us what to do. I know that a lot of time when we sit here, in the Easter season, it, it's a dark side. It's heavy. We talked about it. We've been talking about it. There's a heaviness. To Easter, we think about Good Friday coming. We have time to reflect deeply on the ways that we have been separated from God and from our community. At times, these reflections might make us feel unworthy. Sometimes, when we look at our sin, we think, There's no way the good God would want anything to do with me. But I'm here to tell you that's not true, that's a lie. He wants everything to do with you because he wants to restore you. We are reminded that God is with us. God goes to where we are, wherever that might be. 
I don't know about your personal salvation story or your intervention with God and what was going on in your life, but my, I grew up in a Christian home and still had an, inter, an intervention with God. There came a time when my faith was no longer because my parents believed in God, but because I chose to believe in God. And I have my own stuff that I had to bring to him and say, Lord, how could you still want me after that? But you see, he already paid for it all. He said, because you're my child and I love you. That's why I paid for that. Let go of that. Why are you holding on to that? Because I am not holding on to it. I don't even think about it. While it might have been shocking to the Jewish listeners that witnessed the Messiah behaving in a way that they didn't expect, it is in God's character to love that much. So my challenge to you is, can you love that much? Can you let God change your heart that way? Can you reach out to the community, even though there's, they look different, they smell different, they talk different, maybe they look the same, but they irritate you. I don't know, but can you love them the way that God loves them? Can you love with that kind of love? When we are motivated by love, when we are holy in the love and grace are more infectious than the uncleanliness of sin, God can restore. Because we have surrendered unto him. Okay, God, whatever you want me to do, I'll do it. Even if it scares me, I'll do it. Because it's not in my own strength that I'm going to make that happen. It's only going to be in his strength. We must be focused on our love for God and others instead of our, on our own rules. The boundaries, the walls, all that stuff that we set up, we, we need to put those down. What if Jesus hadn't? Well, then that lady still would have been unclean. And that child still would have been dead. And the man that was filled with demons would have been tortured the rest of his life. I would not be redeemed. I would still be in my sin nature. Not loving, not doing any of that. I would still be judging. Others are longing for this season, as always. But for God who loves them and will go the distance, who has the power to save them. You see, we have that message, a lot of language in that text talks about his immense power. When you go back and read those, and I hope that you do again, I hope that you get the depth of what, what went on in those scriptures. It really identified who Jesus was and what he did. That he was the Messiah. And even his disciples who had been walking with him didn't recognize it, but remember who did. They got it. They're like, mm -hmm. we need to get it because we already know. We know who it is. We have the scripture. We have it all. We, we're not living it. We, we can go back in scripture and read it and we know who he is. We are the ones that carry the message with our presence. You know, when you work for some places, they say, you can't do this or you can't act this way. As a pastor, I am always cognizant of how I'm treating people, how I talk to people, where I'm at. As a Christian, it should be the same. Wherever I am, I am representing God. I'm representing God. Not just me, but all of us that are his children. We are representing him. How we care how we love. Hmm. Who is this man? Waves and the wind obey him. Demons are commanded with power. And we have all been set free to let us live our lives in wholeness. And I'm not talking about a holiness. I'm talking about a wholeness, a completeness. Because he completes us. He fills that hole inside. When we do what? That's Pam's word. Surrender to him. 
Jesus wants to set you free. God wants to set you free. But he also desires to set those around us free too. We are the ones that can share the message. We are the ones that can love people that way. We are the ones who do not run from the world. We are the ones that don't run from the ones that the world despises. We should not be running from them. Jesus didn't. God didn't. What if God had? Well, do you know that he would despise us all then? Just because I get to take a bath every day and I have a nice place to sleep and I have some food doesn't make me any more palatable to God than the man that lives on the street. We're no more palatable. What makes us palatable is what Jesus Christ did on the cross that we're getting ready to celebrate. That's what that's about. That's what makes us palatable to God. We have to embrace them because we know that love transforms people. We've been talking about the fruit of the Spirit and how we're transformed by the fruit of the Spirit, by letting the Holy Spirit live inside of me. It restores all of us so that we can all be a community again. We've been separated a while. We've been in isolation. We've been living in fear. We have all these rules that go on and all these things that go on. But we need community. In my membership class this week, we were talking about why does membership matter? Why do I need to be a member? I don't need to be a member of a church to believe in God. And you are absolutely right. You do not. It's not why you become a member of a church. I become a member of a church because I need people that I am accountable to, people that I can talk to. I need a place where I'm committed to doing the work of God and I have a group of people and we're going to do it together. Let's pick it up and let's go. That's why you become a member. I hope as you spend this week you look around at the world and you find those that the world despises and find a way to reach for them. I hope that God gives you the opportunity to be able to do that. Church, if we don't, then why are we open? If we aren't sharing the message of God, then why do we bother? That's not what it's about. We are to be made disciples. That's what scripture says. It's clear. I'm not preaching just to you. I'm preaching to myself. How do I get next to the those that the world despises? Through him. God help me. I don't even know how to talk to that person. I don't even know what to say. They make me uncomfortable. Well, there was a time in your life when you made God uncomfortable and he didn't walk away from you. They don't walk away from them. They need the message just like the rest of us. So I hope that God gives you the opportunity this week. I pray. I challenge you to find it. Find them. And ask God to show you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I, I come to you today and I, I pray. I pray that they hear your message. And when we look at the world and we look at people that the world despises, it doesn't even matter because, Father God, you love them. So if you love them and we are your children and followers, then we love them. And so I just ask, Father, that you give us a new fire inside of us that says, whatever you want me to do, Lord, I'll do it. You want me to go talk, you want me to go work, you want me to go pray, you want me to go wash, whatever you want me to do, I will do it if it's going to glorify your name and I can share your message. Whatever you'll have me do, I'll do it. All right, I pray that we teach compassion. We don't know where other people have been and we don't get to judge. Because Lord knows we have our own. But I ask, Father, that you just ignite that fire that you had. The unclean. What an interesting thought. And we think that way. We, we don't think we do. We like to think that we don't think about unclean, but we really do. You just put different words on it. And Father, I ask that you, you erase that. And that you give us the boldness to just step forward. Teach us. Teach us how to love the way you do. Allow us to help us to surrender whatever it is that we aren't surrendering. Surrender, Father. Help us to surrender unto you. 
Help us to reach out into our community and to draw everybody back close together so that we can work together and gather together and celebrate and share. And may we just grow in you, Father. May you be glorified. And as always, we give you all the glory. Amen. Thank you. Amen.